I'm recording now. Um, it'll be it'll be all right. So all right, all right. Yeah. If, if you, I got it to work last time, so we'll leave it. I'm gonna go in slideshow mode here. Okay, cool. So today we're talking about this wonderful book, um, The Philosophical Trends in the Feminist Movement. I've never read it before. Um, has anyone here read it before? I have not. Anyone else? Okay, cool. So we're all learning together. Uh, fun. All right. So it's by Anuradha Gandhi. Um, real quick, I just want to go over some... Um, well, actually, let me ask, does anyone want to kind of put some context of, like, uh, behind what's going on here? Um, anyone? What's, um, what's happening? Yeah, just, like, context of what's going on in India, for those who might not be familiar. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Um, so in India, they have a Maoist movement uh, called the Naxalites, which are mentioned here in the, um, in the book. They're like an, an, an insurgency group, and they, um, yeah, they like, uh, uh, mostly in some parts of India, um, they were very, very popular, um, and they've been repressed a lot by the state, but like when they say Naxalites and stuff, that's what they're referring to. Um, what else was there? Um... I'm just going through this real quick to see if there, I should have included a slide about summarizing and putting into context. Um, yeah, there's also a lot of communist parties of India. They have like Communist Party of India Marxist, Communist Party of India Marxist Leninist, um, and then they say Communist Party of India Maoist, um, but that was called the People's War before. So um, that can be a little confusing, but when they say CPI dash Maoist, that's referring to like the Naxalites. Um, which is what uh, the author, that's who she fought with. Um, and anyways, yeah, let's get into it. So in the foreword, right, that was about, I think, um, like 11 pages long or so. Yeah, 11 pages long. So the first sentences of the book, right, something I noticed was uh, they, they talk about how Gandhi was labeled as a, quote, Maoist terrorist by the Indian state. Um and it's true, she did say in her own words that she participated in an armed conflict, but she did a lot more than that, right? Uh, Gandhi was organizing women to protest against um, rape and sexual assault. Uh, she organized literacy campaigns among illiterate workers. Um, and hold on one second. Meadow, what is it, honey? I'm hungry and I want to watch TV. Okay, go watch TV. I just have to, I just started my lessons. I made you food earlier, okay? Sorry, that was a kid <laughs> knocking on the door, but we're good. Um, anyways, yeah, Gandhi did a lot of stuff um, that was helpful, right? It wasn't all just, like, violent. So why, w why would they call someone like that a terrorist, do you think? Um, because he was, like, trying to, to like, free the, the Indian people from the British. Uh, no, this was actually after the British left. This is, to be clear, this is, we're talking about Anuranda Gandhi, the author of this book. She's a woman. Um, I think you're thinking of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi. Who's the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A different Gandhi. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that's also to be clear, um, like, yeah, this was, uh, after, I should have mentioned that, after the period of British colonialism, although... As you see from reading this, the effects of that are still felt to this day. But um, does anyone else have an idea of like why they did that? Why why they call someone like her a terrorist? Because uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, from a pretty distorted perspective, but of the perspective of like the men whose right to like rape women and oppress women that she was fighting against from their perspective, she kind of was a terrorist. I mean, ah. like if you've been used to being able to unleash gendered violence against women, like without punity, and then suddenly you've got groups of women that are showing up at your house and either beating you up, or, like organizing marches against you. Like that is terror. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a really good point. Anyone else? I think maybe this next question will help enlighten that a little bit. So 
Can you think of any others? There's one in particular I'm thinking of, but I'm sure there's many examples. So in our own context in the United States, can you think of similar groups like, um, like Gandhi worked with, um, whose work helped the average people of the United States out, but they were portrayed as terrorists in the media and you know by the government and all that? Anyone got any examples? The Black Panthers. Uh-huh. That's the one I was thinking of. That's what I was about to say. John Brown. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the two that come to mind for yeah. me. John Brown's directly relevant to Kansas, too. Um, yeah, uh, Weather Underground is another one. Um, and with Weather Underground in particular, they never intentionally harmed anyone, and I think they didn't actually kill anyone in practice either. They just did property damage. But again... The way that they're talked about, you would think like, oh man, this is like Al-Qaeda, right? Um, so yeah, I think John summed it up really well that like the reason they're portrayed that way is because to the ruling class, that is terrorism. It just, um, but uh, I just bring that up to kind of show you how that's a loaded phrase, right? Um, okay. Yeah, here's another good question I thought of, right? And um, how does the kind of feminist work in theory that Gandhi advocated and died in service of differ from the conceptions of feminist theory that are popular in the United States and the West more generally? I don't, you know, I don't think that we know enough from the book yet mm -hmm. to answer this question. Okay, that's a fair point. Um, I guess keep that one in mind. Does anyone else have any comments about that? But also, I do want to say that Gandhi was working for the Dalits, which are the lowest caste in the Adivasi, who are the indigenous people of India, mm -hmm. uh, and working for their liberation. And then you have people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, in the U.S., who explicitly were only trying to get vo or rights for white women, mm -hmm. right? She was, and she was a advocate for women's rights, but also an avowed racist. And so that's the difference, I think, is the universal liberation versus liberation for just one section of women. Yes, I think that's uh, wow. That's really well said. That's yeah. Anyone else? I think another part, and this is, I don't know if this is from later in our, today's reading or if i accidentally read ahead but it talks about at some point in this book it talks about cultural feminism and it says quote that cultural feminism begins with the assumption that men and women are basically different it focused on cultural features of patriarchal oppression and primarily aimed for reforms in this area and it adamantly rejects any critique of capitalism and emphasizes patriarchy as like the root of all evils mm -hmm. um yeah, that's uh, what, what do they mean by cultural feminism? Can you give an example of like what that looks like? I'm just trying to sum my thoughts together. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're good. While you're doing that, um, the one I think of, this is when I was like in college and younger, was there's this book called Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, who was like, I think she was like the C chief operating officer for Facebook at the time, right? And her whole thing was, uh, oh, um, you know, and again, it's 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 a it's a definitely a legitimate issue she was highlighting about uh, inequality of pay for women in the workplace and a lot of the discrimination they face. So it's it's not because of that, but it's more like her solution was to really lean into it and you know become the girl boss CEO. I think that's where like that whole idea came from, um, and it's like what Sam said, like. Yeah, that's that's a great solution if you're a, probably a white woman from a wealthier background with a professional corporate career for you as an individual. But like that doesn't do anything to liberate other women. So it's like an individual solution versus a um, a collective solution, right? Um, yeah, and then. Um, yeah, just uh, to what I, what I, I know, Sam said we haven't read far enough in the book, but like. Here on the first page, she's talking about, uh, you know, helping teach uh, study classes to a group of Adivasi women um, who are, you know, teach them literacy, um, you know, helping organize um, community defense um, so that, you know, women could get accountability for uh, men who had harassed and, and assaulted them. Um, 
you, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't seen anything like that uh, too much in the United States, except maybe in like the, the most radical circles, but it's definitely not mainstream. Um, let's see, what else? Um, uh, yeah, so another thing is she also said that she formed an armed contingent of women uh, to, to hold men accountable, right? And again, we, we don't see that anywhere in the United States or in the West more generally. So like, why do you think that can develop in, in a place like India, but not in the United States? I think that for a large portion of people living in, say, the U.S., have been de-radicalized from uh, politics. A lot of people feel disillusioned and disconnected with politics in general. They avoid it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Because if you're if you're disconnected and apathetic, then you're not going to like take up arms against the state. It's kind of, it's kind of like uh, the way I look at uh, with what's going on in France, and it's like, why can't we do that? Mm -hmm. But it's like, I don't, I don't know the questions or the answer to those questions. I don't know. Yeah, um, it is a good question, and, and I think uh, a lot of it has to do also with the fact that we have like police departments in cities like New York that are literally uh, larger than the armies of some entire countries, right? Um that, that might have something to do with it, too. But, um, yeah, I just I just highlight that um, not to encourage anyone to do anything. I'm just highlighting that because it's like to highlight the, the differences and kind of get, get your mind thinking in that direction. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide here. Anyone have any comments or anything before we go on to the next slide? Okay, cool. I'm gonna, there we go. So yeah, if you uh, in the PDF when I say page fourteen, it's on the PDF. Um, but yeah, on page fourteen, and this is in the introduction now. So um, Gandhi speaks of how the development of capitalism led to a uh, quote for the first time in history, a women's own movement emerged that demanded from society their rights and emancipation. So one question I thought of was why did this only emerge under capitalism? The socialization of production, mm -hmm. um, which is inherent. To, so it, if you don't know what that means, it means socialization of production means that uh, as capitalism develops, more and more of the work of the populace becomes workers, right? So before capitalism developed, there was a lot of women were just in the home or women had very limited roles in society. Uh, but as capitalism developed and it requires a workforce a constantly growing workforce the production gets socialized across you know all all walks of life or all you know sections of the population and as women that includes women of course and women get more involved in society where they weren't before that tends to highlight those contradictions a lot more because you have more just more eyes on it in general mm-hmm yeah, that's really well said. Um, anyone else have any ideas or thoughts um, on that? I would rather I would rather phrase this as uh, like uh, women were workers before capitalism too, just mm -hmm. like men. But uh, the work was located in the household, mm -hmm. and as as uh, it became socialized, it moved into factories and other other places outside of the home. And uh, uh, before socialized production, uh, like there were these uh, tiny thieves of uh, male oppression everywhere, like patriarchal oppression in each household. But they, they couldn't form a women's movement because there was no collective which they would they would be going up against. Mm -hmm. So it, 
the so with the socialization of production became or yeah with the socialization of production also came the socialization of oppression is what you're saying right yes so it's not uh okay just within the household but outside the household and women can actually form a movement against something all right mm -hmm. um yeah that's really well said anyone else I'm going to move on to the next question, right? So we talked about this a little bit earlier, but yeah, like Brit or India was brutally underdeveloped at gunpoint and colonized by the British colonizers, right? Uh, and as, as a nation and a people, India was, um, you know, a victim of imperialism. It was uh, artificially, you know, like partitioned um, and just, yeah, like, like it, there's a whole history there. Um, and in many ways, I'd say the, the Indian people still suffer uh, under the duress of global imperialism, right? It's like where it's, it's one of the countries where people outsource cheap labor to. Um, so the workers are highly exploited there. Um, yeah. And, and, and also you have like, uh, I know in the forests and stuff, like there's a lot of um, illegal mining and stuff. So it's just absolutely uh, exploited in so many ways. So what I want to raise is with that in mind, like the history of colonialism, the history of imperialism and all that, um, how might that play into the unique development of uh, Indian feminist thought uh, versus like Western feminist thought? Okay, so one thing that uh, comes to mind immediately is that, well, as we talked about earlier, like within the American feminist movement, at least the mainstream, I understand it's very diverse, but like in terms of mainstream liberal narratives, right, it's very focused on individualism. Uh, it's very focused, like Sam said, on um, securing rights for white women at the expense of uh, non-white women. Um, and so I think, and you can kind of see why that emerges because, uh, you know, the, the United States was and to this very day still is a, uh, you know, settler, colonial, uh, white supremacist republic. Um, and so therefore, you know, you can kind of see that in, in the way that we, um, you know, that feminism manifests itself in the United States. Whereas, um, you know, when, in, in India, because of uh, the colonial oppression, I think that you can see a, a reaching out to a lot more groups like Dalits and, and Adivasis. Um, Within, in particular with those groups in India, because they're like among the most exploited people there. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. And then um, anyone else have any thoughts on that? Okay, cool. Um, so what are some of the contradictions and problems which are, I guess, kind of related to that, which are unique to Indian society, which we don't necessarily see here in the West? Anyone got any examples or anything? Caste is the big one, right? Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit and kind of explain that, Sam? Um, so caste are a system... Um, you know, I'm not really too informed on caste, but it mm -hmm. basically it is derives from the traditional Indian uh, division of society into, you know, there's one caste that's traditionally priest, there's one caste that's traditionally uh, farm workers, et cetera, et cetera. And so that kind of developed into its own unique kind of division and oppression of certain castes. So like the Dalit, which are the lowest caste, they are untouchables. And so there's a lot of discrimination still where jobs, they will like, their jobs will not, will try to avoid hiring Dalits and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that introduces yet another form of oppression I, I don't know i don't know a whole lot about caste yeah. um no i was um yeah i don't i don't either so if anyone here like knows more please like 
that's probably something I should look up like a source that explains that pretty well. Um, and hopefully we learn more about it too as we read the book more. But yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to get at with this question. Um, and then, yeah, this is an important one. Um, so patriarchy as a social system of oppression far, far, far predates the existence of capitalism and even feudalism. Like, it like pretty much goes back to the dawn of human society. Um, and, and so from a material perspective, um, you know, if we want to think about this as Marxists and we want to think about it from a scientific and dialectical perspective, does anyone have any ideas of why that might be? Like, in other words, what material benefits does patriarchy bestow upon oppressor classes, whether it's the uh, ruling oppressor class of feudalism or capitalism or, or whatever, right? Anyone have any thoughts? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, the question is, um, so given that patriarchy like way predates uh, the existence of capitalism, even feudalism, um, like materially, why is that? Like, why is like, in other words, I mean, feudalism does still exist in a few places like Swaziland, for example, but for the most part, um, and again, I understand it's not 100% gone, but capitalism is pretty much came up um, and, and, and that's like the dominant economic system. So why is that the case, but, like, patriarchy is still here with us, right? That's what I'm trying to get at. Is it so, just, like, a tool of control? Oh, sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. It's, it, it's, it's fine. But you said capitalism and patriarchy. So patriarchy predates capitalism, but then you said next that capitalism is... Well, yeah, like, wait, wait, well, I'm... What do you mean capitalism is like? Where I'm not sure. I'm I'm um. I'm not sure what you're saying in the question. Yeah. Not sure what... Um. Well, let's let Ma I think it was Martin who was who was trying to answer. So let's let him. Maybe he can enlighten. You know, has an idea that'll explain it better. Not really. Uh, I was just wondering if like you're like going for like uh, it's being used as like a form of control. Of the masses? Is that what you're going for? Uh, yeah, that, that's one way. But um, I was thinking more about, um, and this is this is tricky because, um, like, reproductive, um, you know, like, in order to have a society go, and I understand that, like, um, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this in a way that's not offensive, but, like, um, it roughly falls along, like, reproductive lines, especially in, like, the traditional patriarchy. That's how they define it, right? And, um... So it's like, it does give you control over how society reproduces itself. Um, I don't know if that makes sense or if there's a better way to say it. That's kind of what I was trying to get at there. And um, it, and it's used as that form of social control. That any, um, does that answer? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Whoever's talking. Uh, someone trying to say something? I thought I heard someone. No, I, I don't think anyone... Can you hear me? I can hear you oh, now, yep. Oh, so sorry. I'm still figuring this out. Oh, you're uh, good. You're good. Um, I was just going to say, uh, in the essay that we read, uh, she mentions that sexual amorphism, which happens in animals as well, uh, plays a role in how the societies have developed. And she says that the... Uh, the hierarchy that is the uh, misogynistic. Uh, what did you say that was? What word do you use? The patriarchy. Yeah, sorry, the patriarchy. Oh, you're good. Uh, predates uh, the capitalist systems, the racist systems, these structures that we've created, uh, and really, it it is what uh, is helping these systems continue because with this uh, with this uh, patriarchy uh, in this system of power, uh, you are able to keep control in the hands of the people that want to gain more control and, and those people want to, to create more capitalist systems, more racist systems, so that the power becomes even more uh, entrenched, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, another thing I think of is um, capitalism also requires us to go to work every day. And if, if uh, you have children, um, you know, like those children got to be cared for somehow. So patriarchy 
uh, also can be a way of like allocating the division of labor along gendered lines. Um, and because you know that what's the stereotypical assumption everyone makes? Oh, it's the woman's job to raise children and so on, right? Um, so in that way, capitalism can um, not that capitalism cares about kids, but like kids are the future lifeblood of the workforce, and so they have to be. Even if, even though capitalism is amoral, it still recognizes you have to have like a proportion of children to replace the labor supply. So, um, how does it do that by utilizing patriarchal values and ideas to really hand her home, like you know, like, like traditional quote unquote traditional gender roles? Or uh, does that make sense? What I'm trying to say there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, Let's see. Yeah, we're doing good on time. And then um, we talked about the, uh, this a bit earlier, but I also want to talk like, how does patriarchy affect, or I guess does it, um, but we kind of talked about this earlier. So how does it affect different kinds of women, like different of, of women of different classes, um, races, uh, you know, like how, anyone? Mm -hmm. wanna... Your mic, your mic kind of cut off a little bit. I wasn't trying to say anything, but it sounded like someone else was. Okay. Um, well, as we talked about earlier, right, like, um, yeah, actually, there was some, some, I was speaking with someone last night, and they brought up a good point. Let me, um, they were, they were talking about how, um, Hey, let me read over this real quick. Yeah, so there you're talking about this is a separate book. Um, it is a book called Right Wing Women by Andrea Dworkin, right? And so, um, I, on one hand, um, women, uh, you know, obviously face like gender oppression and gender based violence and so on, right? But um, what they were talking about was kind of how. Women from more, and it doesn't, you know, like just because you're a, a rich woman doesn't mean you don't experience sexism. You absolutely do, right? But uh, some women, especially from uh, like wealthier backgrounds and stuff, tend to, they, they, she calls it the uh, devil's bargain. Like they say, okay, this world is really terrifying uh, as a woman for me to live yeah. in. So how am I going to keep myself safe? I guess, you know, I'll make the, the compromise and um, align myself with like, right wing, um, you know, like even fascist elements. And uh, I thought that was something that was interesting because that's, um, yeah, like how, how that is used as like a, uh, a defense mechanism of sorts. Um, anyone else? Okay, I'm going to move on to the next one. Um, all right, yeah, so Gandhi on page 16 of the PDF now writes, she writes, uh, the feminists analyzed the symbols and traditions of a given society and showed how they perpetuate the patriarchy system. So uh, does anyone have any examples of, like, in, in American society for us, like, what some of those symbols might be and how they perpetuate the patriarchy? It doesn't you, have, or go ahead, go ahead. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so on page 16 of the PDF, Gandhi writes that the feminists analyzed the symbols and traditions. Oh. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Oh, my God. Okay, we're good. Um, she says the feminists analyzed the symbols and traditions of a given society and showed how they perpetuate the patriarchal system. So I was like, what are some of those symbols? And they don't have to be like a, like a written symbol. It could be like a symbolic figure, um, you know, like a symbolic idea or something. And how do those ideas and symbols, like how do those perpetuate patriarchy um, in like our own society? I can think of one off the top of my head, the, the, this so-called idea of like the quote-unquote alpha male um, that you see floating around in a lot of right-wing, um, you know, like the manosphere and among like fascist circles and stuff. And um, yeah, like that is a kind of a symbol, right? That's like a symbolic sort of 
mental conception of what people think masculinity should look like. And yeah, like look look at what it leads to, like people like Andrew Tate. Yeah. Anyone else got a thought about that? Um. Uh, symbols. Like, um, symbols as in... Like, symbols in a very broad sense. Like, um, I brought up Andrew Tate, so like, yeah, yeah, he's not like a symbol, like a hammer and symbol is a symbol, but he is kind of like a symbolic representation, I guess. You know what I mean? I think maybe, like... Um, maybe, like, <laughs> um, like, I think that another thing that Andrew Tate does is he, um, a lot of people, like, you need to get, like, the, the best car and, like, the best, like, whatever, or, like, you buy expensive shit to, like, Prove your worth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how does that perpetuate the patriarchy? Well, it just, I think that that would maybe make like men feel as though that they need to fit into like, like a stereotypical gender norm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's true. And that, that gender norm is based around like violence against women fundamentally. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's a, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to expand on that. Um, it's the the idolization of wealth as a gender signifier. Mm -hmm. um, does I mean it reinforces traditional gender norms in the patriarchy of, because it. Um, the men are supposed to be wealthy, right? And so idolizing that is how... I don't know where I was going with that, sorry. No, you're good. That's a fair point. Um, I think I want to expand on that a little bit. Um, behind every, like, CEO, workaholic, um, Jeff Bezos type, you know, like, if they have kids, um, you know, assuming they're in a heterosexual marriage or something, it's like there's a woman behind them um, doing all kind of unpaid labor, uh, whether that is their their wife or it could even be like a you know like a housekeeper that they hire who are overwhelmingly women um whether it's one or the other like yeah that wealth like sam was saying was literally built not just on the expects of the exploitation of the people of the companies they work for it's also built on the exploitation of uh, the women in their life who kind of take care of everything behind the scenes for them while they go out and be you know mr cool ceo guy right and uh, I would also say that uh, in a uh, in a relationship, the traditional male is the money maker, the person who's wealthy, and the uh, woman is the subordinate. Mm -hmm. And uh, then someone has a lot of money, everyone else is subordinated to them. The same, not in the same way, but uh, in in a similar fashion as within a relationship. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, money encourages relationships of dependency. And that's why, uh, you know, like why a lot of women... So in a sense... Oh, go ahead. In a sense, uh, if someone has more money, uh, they have more power, and that makes them more masculine. Yes. Because, um, yeah, think of how many women stay in shitty marriages, because, oh, you know, at least, you know... They have some money and, and, you know, I can have a comfortable life at least. And then um, it's like, or, or they're like, I want to break away, but I just, I can't afford it. Like, cause I don't have any jobs or any, you know, I don't have the job prospects and all that to support a lifestyle. And it was, um, it's like, yeah, yeah. And, it, that, and, and that's that sense of dependency, even if it's not like physically brutally violent, it still is like a form of violence. Um, cause you're depriving someone of their, their freedom to live their life and make the choices they want to make, right? Um, yeah, that's those are all good points. Um, 
Oh yeah, this is another one I wanted to talk about that I think is important. So Gandhi speaks of how feminists uphold the importance of the oral tradition. By that means like talking, like uh, oral transmission of knowledge, like storytelling, um, you know, talking, chatting, and so on. So I guess I answered the first part. That's my bad. Um, but I think it's very important to ask ourselves, does anyone have any ideas why feminists in particular would place such a great emphasis on like the oral transmission of knowledge as opposed to, I don't know, written transmission of knowledge? Um, hmm. Oral transmission to written? Yeah. So, repeat the question? Yeah, so like uh, Gandhi in the, in the introduction talks about, she says, uh, speaks a bit about how feminists all have traditionally upheld the importance of oral traditions. Um, and so what I'm trying to say is, why would feminists in particular place such a great emphasis on that? Like, why is it something that's highlighted? Maybe it's so that, like, it's, it's more secretive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's definitely one. I would also say that uh, women in, in the past have been, their literacy has been controlled. Uh -huh. uh, and this is a, like, this has made us, or this has been deliberate so that men are able to keep their power. Uh, and oral traditions are not something that you can really control. Yes, that, that, um, Petamillo, you raised a good point too, but, uh, Caleb, that was, yeah, that was, um, what I was trying to get at there. You said it exactly right. Um, any other else have any comments or thoughts about that? I would add to what was just said, like especially in the like global south where literacy has been a much more recent movement and accomplishment, like mm -hmm. very relevant at the time that Gandhi was writing about the fact that like there may have been a decent chunk of men that were becoming literate, but women the female literacy lagged and so it's really important to get those stories especially because like that sort of story can die with a person and never get told mm -hmm. yeah and also you got to factor in okay given what was said about the history of literacy and how it was only men who really had the the, the luxury of being able to write if you read old you know old stories and stuff uh, old written documents because it's only really men who are able to write like that, you're, you're only going to be getting a masculine male perspective on things. Uh, the written word, especially from in the past, is not going um, to really have women's perspectives on things, um, just by nature of who was and was not allowed to write. And yeah, John's absolutely right. Like To this very day, like in uh, the Taliban, for example, literally... Um, you know, like they, they imprison women uh, um, or even some cases try to execute them for the, the crime, so to speak, of uh, having the audacity to learn to read and teach others literacy. Um, yeah. So, was, oh, go ahead. I want to throw out here that illiteracy in India specifically is actually a modern, somewhat modern development. Mm -hmm. Uh at least in general. I, I mean, I can't speak to, I don't know enough to speak to like the role of women in literacy, but India has a very, very old written tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and it was only with British rule, even starting in just like 1800, 1810 or so, where illiteracy became much more widespread because yes, it was somewhat limited to the upper caste, but, uh, there's still a very, very long tradition of reading and writing in India for thousands and thousands of years. Oh, that's a good point. Thank you for, for sharing that, Sam. I didn't... Yeah, that's that's good. Because, um, yeah, illiteracy is a tool of social control, probably one of the most effective tools. If you don't know how to read, then, you know, you're... You, you, yeah, like, and that would be used by the British to justify colonialism, yeah. Um not only that, but the caste system was also like not that huge of a thing before British rule, but they uh, re reinforced it so that they can keep people in control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we see the same thing, not just in India. I know from firsthand experience in Swaziland, they did the same thing. Like, uh, what's up, buddy? 
Yes, you can make a burger. Uh, Cut out again. Oh, no, yeah, that was, uh, my son had a question for me. Um, we'll wrap this up in, like, ten minutes, if that. But, um, yeah, like, in Swaziland, the whole thing with, like, King Maswati um, being, like, the monarch, like, that, like, that's not an, in, uh, they try and, the government there tries to sell it, like, oh, this is our indigenous African way, stop judging us, but it's really truthfully not. Like, that was instated again by the British um, to, to basically pick out compradors to run the country on their behalf. Um, so yeah, that's a, it's a very classic colonial tactic. Um, I think this is, yeah, this is the last, last, uh, question I have here. So finally to wrap it up, uh, Gandhi talks about the distinctively masculine way of approaching the world and how the male bias of the world's philosophers and how it kind of paints their entire worldview. So I, I was wondering if you can think about that in other realms besides just philosophy, right? So for example, uh, when we think of the word feminism, most people think about, like, the works of white women, like we kind of said earlier, right? Uh, when you talk about feminist uh, theory, no one think uh, I mean, communists do, but most, you ask your average person about, oh, name a feminist, they're not going to say um, Arundhata Gandhi, right? Um, they're going to say someone like Hillary Clinton. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know what I mean, though? But, like, I'm wondering why does that materially, like, happen on some level? Like, what do you think the reasoning for that is? Because liberalism <laughs> has made them think that war, a war criminal like Hillary Clinton is a good feminist symbol. Yeah, well, yeah, that's part of it, but that's not entirely what I was trying to get at there. But that's certainly quite true. Anyone else want to take a shot? I think that for... Like, like in Western countries, or at least in the U.S., that capitalism often commodifies movements and organizations in order to, to de-radicalize them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it uh, is co-opted by uh, men, the market, and control these movements to an extent. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so they, they um, that's a very good point, uh, Liliana. Like, they, uh, it, it's kind of like what they did with uh, Malcolm, or no, like, um, is it, I can't think of the example off the top of my head, but yeah, that's a good point, like commodifying revolutionary images to steer people in the wrong direction. Anyone else have any thoughts about that? Okay, I um I gotta go make some some lunch for my kids. They're they're pretty hungry, so y'all can hang around if you want. I'm gonna stop the recording right now. Um, and as far as next week, just generally speaking.